welcome to the June and Lewis show. This is our second taping, and I'm certainly glad to be able to reach out into your homes and to see you guys from my side of the camera. I want to say today is a special day. Today is one of those days when I, this young man that I'll be talking to and I'm interviewing today, this is exactly what I talk about when I say living wealthy always. And living wealthy always come from the mindset we said, and this young man truly, 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 this guest that I've got today is one of those people that exemplify that to the fullest. This young man's name is Damien Thrash. So Damien is the founder of ink to ink on Transition Service Inc. And I'm gonna tell you something, when you hear this story, I know that it's going to touch lives and because this young man, truly when I heard it, I was touched. So without further ado, let me introduce Damien Trash. Damien, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being on the June and Lewis show. It's a pleasure, Ms. Lewis. Yes. Thank you for having me on. Now, Damien, your story, again, as I told everyone, is one of the most powerful stories. I want you to go ahead and start by telling everyone your story and what brought you to this point to form this particular company. Uh, um, well, once again, thank you, Ms. Julie. You're certainly for welcome. Having me on. You're uh, welcome. Thank pleasure. you for being here. And, um, well, what got me to this point, a little bit about my background, I grew up. Uh, partially in a loving environment with my grandparents uh, who introduced me to God and who I was as a man early on in my childhood years. Yes. Um, my mom had me fairly young. She had me at, at 18, you know, and... Um, so not to cut you, so she's not in your life at this point? My mom, she's, she was in my life, but okay. we, you know, when, when I was born, I'm more of a grandmother's baby. You ever okay. heard of the term? Yes, yes. uh-huh. Um, so my grandmother pretty much raised me until I was like seven years old. I lived with her. You okay. Know. My mom left and got an apartment. Where and, was your uh, dad? My dad was actually in college. He went to FAMU. He's a FAMU alumni. And uh, him and my mom weren't together. They were high school sweethearts. They weren't together at the time. And I was raised by my stepfather. Okay. So to fast forward a little bit, my mom left my grandparents' you know, household and she moved into a housing project. Uh, this was a very different environment for me, but I adapted fairly quickly. So you left your grandmother and mm. went with mom with to mom. the housing project. Okay. Right. And my stepfather was in my life at that time. Great guy, loving guy, foundational man, respectful. The only thing was he was a hustler, you know. He sold drugs and he was a great provider, never hit my mom, never, you know, in the South they call it whoopings. Never whooped me, just talked to me like a man, told me to respect my elders, do my schoolwork. He encouraged me, you know. Yes. Uh, and my three sisters as well. Okay, so let's move forward to your beginning life out of their home. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Um, just regress, regress slightly. I learned how to hustle drugs and learned the uh, entrepreneurial uh, f business model from my stepfather from his illegal activities at a young age. So when I ended up leaving my mom's house and going independent, me being the only boy and my stepfather going to prison, it snatched all of the lifestyle amenities away from us. So it was another drastic change. We not only lived in the projects, we had houses as well, you know. And we lived so a pretty stop that. affluent lifestyle. You said you lived in the projects, but yeah. you owned homes? My, my stepfather, yeah. But he was living in the projects? He did his business out of you know, Out of the projects, okay. The projects, so, but that's so. where you guys actually lived? Yeah, my mom had the apartment. We would leave there okay. at night and go back to our house and whatnot. So my, my stepfather was pretty major in the drug game oh, okay. you know, when I was younger. So, so he's a drug yeah. dealer, and right. this leads you into that life? Right, it, it okay. leads me into that life because you you know, you know, can, um, you only learn from the people who mostly influence you, right. mentors, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, like I said, he was I, your hero. He was. Yes. You know, uh -huh. he, he he did a lot for the community. Yes. You know, him and his you know my quote unquote uncles they did a lot for the kids right. and so forth. So. When he left and went to prison, it was a drastic change, and financially, I was the one that took the, the uh, brunt of that financial drop. And 
just the whole lifestyle of being a young black male growing up in the inner city, you have a lot of pressures on you, you know? And for me, it was just eating, being able to eat, because I like to play sports. Um, in school, I was a pretty above average student, you know? And I just didn't have the energy because my mom worked at a, a part-time job. She had never worked in her life. So okay. she had three of my three sisters were her primary focus, my younger sisters. So you took yeah. on the role of the man of the house. Right. Okay. And in yeah. doing so, because you were a teenager, you were a young man at this time, right. mm -hmm. and you, I'm assuming, you did you go to college? No, I didn't go to college. I actually okay. dropped out of high school um, my ninth grade year. Okay. Because at that point, I was making probably $1,000 a week. You know? And so, obviously, yeah. to a, a child at a high schooler, you're making a thousand, which is probably yeah. what most adults was making themselves in your environment, right. and probably even less than that. You went into less, yeah, yeah. Yes. You so obviously the lifestyle looked good for you. Eating, as you said, was the main thing. It was my main focus. And yes. being able to support your family. So, right. take it so from there. So, it, it, being introduced already knowing the dynamics of street life, right. it was pretty fairly easy for me. You know. Because, like I said, my stepfather, he had such a long reach in the streets that I was kind of grandfathered in. So if they didn't know me, they know him. And I pretty much, uh, I had a lot of connections because I had other family members still involved with drugs as well. Okay, so, so you would call your, your stepfather's name, I am so-and-so's son? Or they would just know that, because back then you would have to have some type of voucher for you to be on that block. It's not like it, how it I is see. today. I okay. Right. You know, and it was more of a grown man's game. I was kind of a... Uh, uh, a prodigy because I was a kid in a grown man's world and my stepfather and along with things that I knew allowed me to be in that world. Right. It was fairly dangerous for somebody So let's age. take it back a sec. How old were you when your stepfather went to prison? Uh, the last time I was like 12 or 13. Yeah. So you're 12 or 13. You right. dropped out in the ninth grade. Right. The income is low. It's not to the level that you guys are accustomed to. So now you step in as man of the house right. and you are dealing drugs. And even at the age of 12, yeah. they're allowing you in the community to be yes. a drug dealer. Yes. Okay. They allow me. Um, you, they allowed you, you were a drug dealer, you're making a thousand dollars or are you making more than that after that? Uh, at that time I was making at the max a thousand dollars a week, you know, that was, you know. That's four thousand dollars a month. A month. That's yeah. paying everything. That's it's, paying everything yeah. and being able to go to the mall like I want to. It drastically changed my, out, my outcome. Okay, you know? so move forward so. to where you are. You're a drug dealer. What takes you to prison? What happened that you uh, wind up in prison? Because I know you mm -hmm. went to prison. Um, fairly 10 years went by. I had a 10 year run. I never went to prison, but I caught cases. Um, I was, like I said, I was groomed to set money aside, to save, to think of the next day, to think of it as an investment. And I had lawyers, I had bills bombing. So when I would catch a case, I already was paid up. I wouldn't stay in jail. My lawyer would beat my cases. So all of my friends that I was around my age or older, I really ran with older guys. They had been to prison two or three times when ended, I hadn't. So by that time, me being able to stay out on the street and constantly cultivate my business, I grew in stature and in wealth. So I started making a, a significant How much money are you money. making? At my peak, I was making about 25000 a week okay. as far as take-home profit. And at so. this point, I'm assuming you have a staff. Yeah, I had a staff. I had uh, three main uh, lieutenants that was my immediate table. And then we had a distribution uh, network of 30 other dealers. And, and just so, because for me, myself, I'm learning at this right. point. So when you say you have three lieutenants, is it a gang? Is it just an organization? What is it? Did uh, you no, it's it? not a gang. It's just more, it was more of an organization. Okay. Uh, 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 we looked at it as a business and a way to support and feed the families of everyone that was around What's your us. title? Uh, my title, I was the head. I was the... The head person? Okay. Yeah, I so was you the catch head. the case and you're in prison now. Right. Um, tell me from there, what happened? The epiphany, you told me you had an epiphany. Uh, yeah, I catch the case. Um, I go to prison for 20 years. The judge sentences me to 20 years for um, trafficking and conspiracy to traffic cocaine. Uh, while I was in the prison, the first 
five, six years, I continued to do the same things I was doing while I was out on the streets. You know, it's no different. You know, it's just a smaller world. Right. And uh, by me continuing to do that, um, I ended up going to jail in prison. You can go to jail in prison. In a lot prison. of people don't yes. know that. You go to mm -hmm. the hole or the shoe. So I ended up um, going into the hole and finding out my mom was, had an aggressive form of breast cancer and she was in emergency surgery. A couple of days later, they came back and told me my sister was uh, diagnosed with a strand of uh, thyroid cancer that was aggressive and she was in emergency surgery. Um, that same day, I found out one of my closest friends has been killed in Arizona on a bad drug deal. And to top that, my girl at that time, who was with me, I was with at that time, she couldn't take it anymore, so she left me. And then my attorneys told, uh, sent their assistant to visit me and told me that all of my appeals had been denied. So I had another uh, 14, 13, 14 more years to do. I thought I was going to get out early. And you thought you were getting out this time in about six to eight years? Yeah, I thought okay. that I was about on the threshold of getting out. I thought my appeal okay. was going to be overturned. So what happens to bring you to the epiphany you said caused you to create this company? At that moment, everything was stripped away from me. Right. Everything that I ever known, the right. control that I had, the right. hope that I had of getting out. Right. Everything was taken away. I thought my mom wasn't going to be there when I got out. I thought that, you know, my, my life was over. Yes. And I went back to what I was first taught, which is to cry out to God, just cry out to your creator, you know what I mean? And that's all that I had. And naturally, by me having that relationship with him, even when I was younger, and even throughout my ordeal in the streets, I still was connected, I still prayed, I still talked to him. Even though I was most of the time when I was in trouble, and he came through for me. And when I uh, cried out to him, he pretty much, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, they don't believe in religion or whatever, but you know, this is my personal account. It's he spoke your experience. to me. Yes. And mm -hmm. he told me, you know, this is why I took you through this. This is why I spared you when you were going through this. This is why you're walking through this. You serious about what you're asking me? This is what I want you to do. And he gave me the epiphany. He gave me my whole program. He gave me my gift, what it is that he, you know, created me to do. Okay, and what he created you to do, tell everyone what it is that you're doing now that you have founded this organization, Ink to Ink. Um, what he created me to do is uh, he showed me how to create Ink to Ink on Transition Services, which is on transition is entrepreneurial transition uh, services. And what we do at Ink to Ink, we pretty much empower aspiring incarcerated entrepreneurs and ex-offenders who want to open up or launch their own businesses. We teach them self-confidence, leadership, and just the soft skills to be able to communicate and translate the language, street language into business terminology to be comfortable in that environment. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. You know what's interesting? <clears throat> and I've heard a similar situation to this, the fact that you were a young man and your life as you said, you look to your heroes, and your yes. hero was somebody who was doing something that maybe he saw somebody else doing. Right. And you, so that's right. what you did until you were a product of your environment that you lived in. Yes. But you made it out and turned it around into a positive situation. Right. Definitely. What do you have to say to somebody listening out here now that's whether or not they're seeing this, whether or not they're incarcerated, or they might have just gotten out? Right. What do you have to say to encourage them and tell them? more about what they can do to change their lives? First thing first, what I would say is um, confidence, believe in yourself and your talent and your ability that you were blessed with. Whatever it is that you're great at, that you, you do the best with, less, with the less effort, concentrate on that and most importantly, correlate that. If it isn't already directly uh, helping someone or a whole demographic of people, Find someone to help, find someone else to, to empower, to make their life better. Because if you do that, then everything else is going to come together. I've been home now 16 months. Um, I launched a for-profit business in prison. You know, don't wait. Don't wait to the perfect moment. Don't yes. wait to everybody s saying that they like you. You know, you're going to have a million no's before you have one yes. You know what I mean? And... Uh, just fight through it and believe, you know, and it all, it all work out. Yeah. But for the, anyone that's out that just came home or you're still inside and you're watching this, 
Contact from Ink to Ink. We haven't officially launched yet. We're just a nonprofit now. We're in 501c3 registration at this point. But we're going to, we're planning our launch for September 28th, uh, 2018, which will be the two year mark for me being home. So, okay. So please tell them how they can reach you and if, are you on social media? I'm on social media on okay. Facebook at Damon Thrash. Just log in and friend me. Uh, like I said, in a few months, we have a website, but it's under construction. We're in branding right now. We're going to have some dynamic and awesome branding for you guys. It, we're at inktoink.org. Also on Facebook, Ink to Ink. Um, just Ink to Ink. We're on Instagram as well. You know, we're building, we're in branding. So we'll be at you real soon. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Damon, for that information and sharing and for coming forward because so many times there's so many people in Damon's situation that doesn't want the world to know, oh, I was incarcerated. I don't want anyone to know. And right. it's because of the stigma that's placed on you after you're incarcerated. Right. Most of the time, society not realizing that these people have paid their dues for whatever the crime is. And it's not upon us as human beings to judge after that. You accept somebody for who they are and what they're doing at the current time because because these people have paid a price and don't judge them based on their past, judge them based on who they are in front of you and what they're doing to move forward. We can help make a difference for each and every person that's incarcerated. Yes, granted, I know there's other things, there's people that don't need to do that. They need probably help after they get out and that's understandable because you judge it case by case, but sometimes people take it the whole circumference. Find out what somebody did, what happened, and then take them from their lives from there. And you know, the reason that I commend Damien is because most of the times when men get out, or women, it doesn't matter, when they get out of being incarcerated in jail, whichever it is, first of all, they lose a lot of rights. They can't vote anymore, so that power is taken away from them for them to be a part of society, a regular form of society. But the most thing is that most of the time they're not even able to be employed. Most employees do not want to deal with people that have been incarcerated, regardless of what the incarceration is about. So the fact that Damien has come up with something to help those in this local area. And Damien, are you going to have it outside as well, outside of Florida? Um, of course. Our, in our plan, it's to scale nationally and then go global because incarceration is not just a problem in the U.S., even though it's one of our the hugest problems in the U.S., also in Europe and other uh, foreign countries is, is a major issue as well. Yes. So okay. our, our, our goal is to scale nationally. That's our next move. Okay, good. And understandably so. I'm not saying that everyone that's in prison is perfect or anything like that. But when people come out or someone comes out of incarceration, they deserve a chance as a human being to be given the same rights as everybody else. And so we as human beings and even the country and around the world need to understand that. If we don't help them when they come out, they, uh, they're more than likely going to lead right back into the same life. And so it's just a repeated system. Right. And so we don't want that. And, and, and our governments and our, and our higher ups in society, we really need to focus on that. And I know, as I was told, more than likely it's a business. They don't care. They make money off of people that are incarcerated. But at the same time, let's do what we have to do as human beings and recognize that the other person next to you, regardless of what it was, is a human being just like you. Now, I want to say thank you so much for joining us in the June and Lewis show. Today, it was very, very touching for me to hear this story about Damon and the fact that he's come, was brave enough to come forward and share his story with others so that people can be touched and influenced and benefit from it. Now, I want to say something to you guys. We've got a big show coming up um, two weeks from now. And on that show, we're going to have a very special guest. And I promise you, I can't mention the guest yet because of the fact that the person has not cleared it. But I mentioned something about Black Panther before. And that guest is going to be a powerful guest. Thank you so much for watching the June Ann Show. Remember, subscribe and like us. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on um, Instagram as well. Everything is the June Ann Lewis Show. I certainly do appreciate you allowing me to come into your life and continue to be positive and remember living wealthy always is a mindset you can do anything you want to do the person that's stopping you most of the time it's you so it's all about you it's all about you you oh no i can't sing but anyway thank you guys have a blessed one bye-bye